Well, my apologies for the uh, slight delay due to technical uh, problems. So um, I've talked one lecture about uh, uh, data and the brain and what sort of graphs you can, u uh, you can use to represent the brain. The second lecture was about um, topologies, so basically random graph models that might be applicable to the brain. And now my third lecture will be all about functionality. And the way how we view functionality is by a process that acts on the topology that we have. So I, if you look at the, the neuronal level, you should really think about the cells and their connections. Um, that would give rise to the topology. So you look at two neurons and see whether they're connected or not. Maybe you should even take multiplicity into account. And then uh, the process of the brain or the functionality of the brain will be viewed as a process acting on that. And I will give a few examples of models that have been proposed for brain functionality. Um, I will talk about the Easing model, bootstrap percolation. Uh, that's something that we've already heard yesterday. Uh, and integrate and fire models. And in each of these models, I will also discuss the relation between excitation and inhibition. Most of these models actually uh, are primarily uh, excitatory. But it's interesting to, to look at the inhibitory effects as well, because that would be much more realistic for the brain. And it's not always clear how, that, how to take that into account. All right. So um, this is a, a slide that we've seen before uh, in my very first lecture. It's about weighted brain graphs. And uh, uh, what we do there is um, we try to measure uh, the, the brain functionality of uh, a human or an animal by either doing EEG data or fMRI data. And that gives you lots of time series. And what you then do is you have some measure of association between different time series at different uh, vertices, at different nodes in your, in your graph. And that then gives rise to a weighted graph. And sometimes from the weighted graph, one gets regular graphs by uh, truncation or something like that. Now, the question is, what is a good way to represent uh, such data? Now, of course, this is not data that we're, that we're actually measuring on the neuronal level. And the kind of graphs that I typically think about are graphs for uh, uh, the brain at a neuronal level. So then still the question is how to kind of use these models and say something about whether uh, these models are applicable in this uh, uh, sense for EEG data. Um, so the, the big question is how to obtain informative network data from collection of the weights that we get. And, uh, uh, of course, networks tend to be binary, but maybe you can get more information from the weighted graph. That's not so clear. Now, I wanted to show this one again as well. I've also shown it in the, in the first lecture. All models are wrong, and I think this is a way of, uh, of viewing mathematics. Um, any model that we'll propose for a real-world situation will be wrong because it will not take all of the different parameters, all of the different cases, all of the different possibilities into account. But what you would like to do is, is propose a simple model that has the key features of the, the process that you're interested in and that will actually tell you something about sort of how you can understand the real world. So it's not, about, not always about finding a very good model, but it's, it's about finding a useful model that will actually learn you something about uh, uh, what, we're, what we're observing. So uh, this is what uh, George Box says about it. For such a model, there's no need to ask the question, is the model true? If truth is to be the whole truth, the answer must be no. That means that all models are wrong. The only question of interest is, is the model illuminating and useful? Does it explain us something about what is really happening? And that, then, of course, that raises the big question, if we're thinking about the brain, how should one cunningly choose uh, a model for both the brain functionality as well as for, it, for its uh, uh, topology. And in particular also the interaction between these two. All right. So brain functionality, um, sort of at a very high and abstract level. Um, first of all, the mathematical models, they tend to focus on ex excitatory uh, uh, interactions. Now, of course, that's not how the brain works. There's also inhibition. So one would need that to take that into account. And uh, you know, I've understood from the neuroscientists that for global stability, these inhibitory uh, um, interactions are very, uh, very important. Um, so what I will do is I will describe a, uh, a few models that describe these excitatory uh, 
interactions between neurons uh, that have been proposed in either math or in neuroscience. And then I will also discuss extensions, possible extensions uh, that uh, include inhibition. So all of this is extremely speculative because, well, first of all, we don't know whether the models are any good. And secondly, many of these models are completely new and they have not been investigated in math. So we don't really know what the behavior is. So that's really the challenge for, well, both mathematicians as well as neuroscientists to somehow tune into a model class that would be realistic enough. That would be one challenge. And the second challenge would be then for the mathematicians to investigate these models and say something sensible about that and relate that back to the things that we see in the brain. Um, now, the way how, how I will be uh, looking at it is I will think about the topology of the brain as being fixed. Now, in a short time interval, that's probably quite correct. Of course, in longer time intervals, that may not be correct. We don't really know that. Certainly, if you look at the evolution of the, the brain from a fetus to an adult, it will change dramatically in terms of growth and, and, and the, uh, um, the creation of connections between the different neurons. But think about sort of a brain on a daily basis. I don't think that our brains change that heavily, let's say, from, day, from today to tomorrow. So then it would mean that the, the graph that we're investigating is a static graph. It basically is fixed. And then the functionality of the brain, the things that we do during the day, are then described by a process that acts on it. Now, I'm a probabilist, so I, I, what I will do is I will try to model the, the inherent complexity that is available in all of these different settings, both in terms of the topology of the network as well as in terms of the process that acts on it, I will model that by using uh, uh, stochastic aspects. So the graphs will be random graphs, and the processes will be stochastic processes. So stochastic just means random. Now, of course, uh, one should bear in mind that the reality is much harder. Um, the, 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 the network that describes the brain actually does change. I mean, this is all related to learning. Some synapses might be pruned. Some synapses will be strengthened because they're used a lot. So in the very long term, the brain will change due to its functionality. And this is something that in mathematics is not very common, that you have stochastic processes acting on networks where the topology of the network actually changes because of the process that acts on it. And this is, of course, a very fascinating area when you... Uh, consider this interplay. And we'll say some very speculative things about this sort of at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the lecture. Okay? So this is the disclaimer. Reality is always much harder. But we already know that. So, All right. So uh, the very first model that is sometimes proposed to, to model the brain is the Easing model. And we've already heard the phrase Easing model come by uh, not, uh, lots of times uh, during this conference. So maybe it's worthwhile to actually explain in some detail what it is. So an easing model on the general graph is, is originally uh, invented as a model for magnetism. So you have at every vertex in the graph, you have a, a spin, and you can just think of that as being an arrow. The arrow points upwards or it points downwards. And this is a, a sort of a very simple model for, for magnetism. And if you have a metal, for example, and it's not magnetized, then you should really think of all of the atoms in the, uh, uh, in the metal as somehow being randomly pointing up and down, and therefore, on average, you will not see any, uh, any magnetization. Now, of course, when you, when you put a piece of metal, metal in front of a, a, a strong uh, magnet, that actually will attract the spins, and this is sometimes called an external field, and they will all start pointing in the same direction. And uh, when they all point in the same direction, then actually the metal will be magnetized. Now, what can happen is that um, you take your piece of metal, you put it in front of a large magnet, then you put it away and take it home with you. You're very far away from the, from the very strong magnet, but still your piece of metal will be magnetized. So this is sometimes called spontaneous magnetization. And this is something that is described very beautifully by the work uh, uh, by, uh, by Gibbs. And uh, it, it basically means that depending on, the, on the, uh, the parameters of the model, in particular the temperature, when the temperature is low, things tend to stay more alike. So that means that if you put it in front of a magnet, the effect of that magnet will be much stronger than if the temperature is very high, because if the temperature is very high, everything is moving about, and therefore you tend to much more quickly forget the initial conditions. 
So that's the whole philosophy of uh, how a magnet works. And the Ising model is a very simple model, a very caricature model to capture that reality that we really observe. I mean, this, this story that I was telling you about uh, a magnet, that's really true. That's how uh, magnets really work. So how does that go? Well, as I was saying, the Ising model is a spin system. Vertices can be in two states. It's traditionally called plus one and minus one. Uh, and, you know, if you think of this in terms of the brain, and it's, of course, um, uh, highly uh, debatable whether this could be a good model for the brain, but you could think of it as uh, thinking of a one as indicating that the neuron fires and minus one as the neuron not firing. Very simple. So the Ising model then aims to describe the collection of firing neurons and the non-firing neurons on a large graph. So think again about this uh, uh, magnetization. So here we, ha we again have our graph. G is a collection of vertices and a collection of connections between the vertices, a collection of edges. That's our graph. And then on top of that, we have an extra thing, and that's called the spin collection. So that means that at every vertex in the graph, we assign this plus or minus one, and we don't do that in an independent and identically distributed way. Because if we were to do that, then, of course, there would be very little uh, dependence and spontane spontaneous magnetization will not occur. It will just be washed away. The system will not have any memory. So we will have to build in the memory. And the way to do that is by uh, deciding what the, uh, uh, what the distribution is. And this distribution is, as is quite common in physics, described by a Hamiltonian and then there is a partition function to, to normalize it. And this Hamiltonian, which you can think of as being an energy, is described by sort of how similar the spins in different, uh, in different uh, uh, vertices that are next to one another are. So in a magnet, if I have one vertex that is pointing up, it's more likely for his neighbors also to be pointing up. That's actually the thing that will enhance magnetism because they all want to point in the same direction, and when they all want to point in the same direction, well, they, it actually is magnetized. Okay? So that's the idea. And the way how that is being incorporated is that in this exponent, beware of the two minus signs. That's always very confusing, but that's how it's done in physics. Um, in this Hamiltonian, you have this term, which actually enforces the spins, the sigmas, in, in nearest neighbor vertices to be the same. So if I look at the contribution here, if the two are the same, I will get a plus one or a plus beta. If they are different, I will get a minus beta. And because I put that in the exponent, having two neighboring pluses or two neighboring minuses is energetically favorable compared to having a plus and a minus next to one another. So differences in the spins are exponentially um, penalized. That's one way of viewing it. And then, of course, you can also... Um, model in something which is called an external field, that is this uh, object, and this is really what you should think about when I take my piece of metal and hold it in front of a large magnet, then actually that large magnet will start pulling on all the spins in a certain direction depending on the, the, the sign of the magnetization of the magnet. So if it's plus magnetized, then it will try to make all of the, the atoms in your, the piece of metal that you're holding in your hand also to be plus. And that's a way of, of putting this in. So H being positive will try to make the sigmas all to be positive as well. So, of course, if you, if you think about this object here and you just ignore the, the fact that uh, uh, these spins are actually variable, and you just look at what would happen, what is the, sort of the most likely um, way for the spins to be organized, if my H is positive, then actually all the spins would want to be one. They're all one. That actually gives the highest energy. But of course, that's only one realization. Whereas if you have all of them being plus or minus one, you have lots of different uh, uh, realizations or configurations. So there is a mix here between what is called entropy, how many um, configurations there are with that many pluses and minuses next to one another, and energy. The energy favors all of them to align, all of them to be the same. But, of course, entropy is then very low. So you will somehow end up somewhere in the middle. Okay. So this beta here is sometimes called the inverse temperature. You should really think of it as 1 over the temperature. And it determines the preference for neurons to fire together or for vertices to be aligned magnetically. 
all right. Now, this is a model for the stationary distribution of a Markov chain. You can also describe this dynamically by starting with a collection of spins and sort of trying to flip them, depending on how that affects the energy. And this is sometimes called Glauber dynamics. And what you then do is you have your collection of spins and you choose a vertex uniformly at random, say, and you want to decide whether you want to flip that or not. And that depends then on whether the energy goes up or down. When it goes up, you're very happy to keep it, and you'll actually do it for certain. When it goes down, you might do it, but you may not do it. And actually, the, the, the stationary distribution of this uh, Markov chain on the collection of spins is precisely the measure that I was talking about here. Okay. Now, as I was describing, there's a phase transition which depends on the temperature. So if the temperature is sufficiently low and I hold my piece of metal close to a, a, a strong magnet and I take my piece of metal away, it will still remain on being uh, uh, magnetized. That's called spontaneous magnetization. If the temperature is very high, this is not going to happen. Okay? So if I want to describe that mathematically, it means that there exists a critical beta C and... Um, if I'm below it, which means, so if beta is below it, which means high temperature, this is always very confusing, um, the stationary distribution is unique, and you should think of this as being somehow very random and very oscillatory, and you're not going to have magnetization. Uh, above it, two distinct stationary distributions uh, exist, and they somehow correspond to, well, favoring plus or favoring minus, and one way to view that is if you have a, a magnet that is pulling one way and you remove your piece, of a uh, uh, magnet, then, it will, then all of the spins will align upwards. If you're pointing towards a magnet that points downwards, you take your piece of metal away, and then almost everything will point downwards. So it's a very ordered state, state and by symmetry, there are two of them for the, for the external field being equal to zero. So that's sometimes called spontaneous magnetization. And there's a lot of knowledge that we have mathematically or physically about the near-critical behavior of Ising models on random graphs or on two-dimensional graphs. No? All right. Maybe this is, a, this is the right time to show my video. I have a video that, that somehow uh, very informally describes what the Easing model does in terms of We can display social computer. networks as graphs. On these graphs, many processes are active. Indeed, people influence one another through their social interactions. For example, on whether they eat meat or are vegetarians. It turns out that the network structure is crucial in how such influence spreads through the network. For example, on the left and on the right, we see two distinct networks. We investigate what the effect is of an external event. For example, when mad cow disease strikes, people are worried about the possible bad effects of eating meat. They influence one another by talking about it. These discussions may cause them to become vegetarian. We see that this happens much more frequently on the right side than on the left, even though the number of connections are roughly the same. The reason lies in the difference in network structure. The network on the right has many vertices of very high degrees, or hubs, and they play a crucial role in how populations reach consensus. Informally, when such a hub becomes vegetarian, he or she influences many people around him or her. So this is a video that was made by the Institute for Complex Molecular Systems, um, and it was my design. Um, oh, let's kill this. There's actually two more videos here that describe uh, somehow the philosophy or the basic ideas behind, well, first of all, a network and what is a graph, and secondly, about sort of what is a small world. How can I understand that in terms of social uh, uh, connections? All right. So um, the e -sync model is... It's still there. Kill it. Oh. So the philosophy 
in applying the Ising model to different settings is that sort of on a very high metaphorical level, the interactions we see in many networks are similar. If we talk to our friends about subjects, we tend to align our opinions. Of course, we don't always do that. Sometimes we just agree to disagree. That's fine too. Uh, and that's also present in the Ising model where you have two neighbors where one is pointing upwards and one is pointing downwards. But we're more likely, we're, we're, habits of cre uh, we're creatures of habit, and we also uh, tend to seek consensus in social contexts. We're, we're more likely to have an opinion that is shared by our friends. And the Ising model is just a very simple caricature model that describes this. And uh, if you think about the brain, you could also say that neurons that are close by are more likely to fire together because they actually influence one another. Now, of course, there is no physical, biological process behind it that is anywhere reminiscent of an Ising model. But it could be that at a very high level, somehow the behavior uh, of the Ising model could be a caricature version of how the brain acts. All right. So let's say a few things about the, uh, about the Ising phase transition. And now I'll be applying this to the configuration model, which is one of the random graph models that I've spent a lot of time on describing yesterday. And what we see is that, um, as described in the, in the video, there is a large dependence on the precise properties of our network. Now, configuration model. Um, so um, what we see is that there is a strong relation between the topology of the graph and the behavior of the process that acts on it. Now, if I describe the configuration model, the only input parameters are the degree sequence. And if I think of that in a scale-free setting, it very much depends on um, the degree parallel exponent, which we often uh, indicate by tau. And we really see that that makes a big difference. If tau is smaller, then somehow the graph is more connected, more strongly connected, and then the influence of the Ising model is much higher. And you can understand that by, by positioning yourself in a vertex in the graph that has lots of neighbors. Now, if I have lots of neighbors and I'm pointing upwards, then I'll actually influence lots of my friends to also point upwards. So somehow the, the effect of the nearest neighbor sort of pointing in the same direction, the, making it more likely to align, is much more pronounced in graphs where you have a high amount of connections much more so than in graphs where you have a small amount of connections. And the question is, can we see that back in the mathematical theory, the mathematical results that are being proved about it? Now, one picture is here. What we see is that in the Ising model, the critical uh, beta parameter is equal to zero for tau in between two and three. And that actually means that for any temperature, it doesn't matter how high, the system will become magnetized if you if you apply an external uh, field to it and then remove the external field. So there is spontaneous magnetization at all temperatures. That's kind of weird. Yeah. So this describes the fact that when you have many hubs, actually it's very uh, likely to become magnetized. So you have really uh, sort of a macroscopic effect to an arbitrarily small external effect. So in terms of social media, you can think about external media, newspaper articles about certain subjects or something like that. <coughs> now, when the third moment of the degree distribution is finite, we see something different. And we already saw this distinction between the different cases in, in the, the, the setting of distances. In this case, the distances were logarithmic. In this case, the distances were doubly logarithmic. So there is a big effect of these, these rare vertices that have very high degree. And we see that here as well in terms of the critical value. So if the second moment of the degree distribution is finite, then actually the critical value will be strictly positive. That means that when the temperature is sufficiently high, you will not have spontaneous magnetization. Or in terms of the social context, um, let's say Bessie, the cow dying, will only have a, uh, an influence for a very short amount of time and it will evaporate very quickly. Um, whereas if the temperature is sufficiently uh, low, which means that people are much more inclined to align to one another, to listen to one another in the social context. If Bessie dies, it will have a lasting effect. Okay? That's basically the very sort of cartoonist picture of this. All right. Now, there's another thing that we, we, we tend to see, and that is that, well, 
certainly in the brain, it's often claimed that the brain organizes, uh, organizes itself into something which could be called a critical state. Now, it's not at all clear why that is the case, and I think that was a large part of the discussion yesterday, um, but there is some empirical evidence for this. So that actually means in this, uh, um, in this Eastern context that we're quite interested in what happens very close to the critical value. And the statistical physics way of looking at this is that um, the behavior close to criticality is characterized completely by the existence of what are called critical exponents. And these critical exponents describe what happens when you sort of slightly move away from the critical point. And the critical point in this case is the critical temperature, the critical inverse temperature, and the external field being equal to zero. So if beta is slightly bigger than beta c, or h is slightly bigger than zero, what you would believe is that the spontaneous magnetization will be positive, but it will be very small. It will actually be a very simple function of this value of h, or of the difference between beta and beta c. That's the whole concept of critical exponents in a nutshell in statistical physics. Now, what our results are showing is that if I look at this magnetization, where I put in the critical value for the temperature, but then apply a very small external field, then the magnetization will be very small, and it will be small as a positive power of the external magnetization. So if you're very far away from this strong magnet, you will have a very small amount of magnetization, but it will diminish as you move further and further away. And how will it diminish? Well, it will diminish as a very simple function of how far away you are, meaning how much of an external field do you feel, and that is described by this power of H, and this 1 over delta, or delta, is what is called a critical exponent. It appears in an exponent, and it describes the behavior close to criticality. That's why it's called a critical exponent. Now, as it turns out, in this setting, um, it turns out that the, uh, the, the critical exponents take on very simple values if tau is sufficiently large. This should not be tau larger than 3, but tau larger than 5. So here we see a behavior depending on whether tau is in between 2 and 3 or larger than 3. Here we see a difference in behavior depending on whether tau is larger than 5 or tau is in between 3 and 5. So again, there's a strong relation between the behavior of your system and its topology, in this case measured in terms of the degree distribution. So these are sometimes called the uh, mean field critical exponents. They correspond to let's say, a, a magnet in very high dimensions, or a, a mean field magnet, which is called the Curie-Weiss model. There you have precisely the same critical exponents. So if tau is larger than 5, beware, this should be a 5, then you have these, um, uh, these mean field critical exponents, but when tau is in between 3 and 5, you get completely different exponents. So there, really, the hot nature of your graph is very pronounced, and therefore this will actually change how the magnetization tends to zero when you approach the critical behavior. Again, the hubs are very pronounced, less pronounced than here, because here it immediately means that if you do anything, you're again, you immediately will be magnetized, whereas here that's not the case. There is a critical value which is strictly positive, but if you're very close to it, um, how magnetized you are will depend on the precise topology of your network. Now, of course, in the e model, this is not probably not a good model for the brain, but I will get to the brain uh, in a little later. And so the question is, can we apply the Ising model to the brain? Well, maybe at a very uh, large sort of mesoscopic level. Um, of course, in the brain you have a, a sort of some sort of a hierarchical modularity. There are different parts of the brain that are more strongly connected within than outside. And the question is what the effect of that is. That's com completely ignored in the uh, configuration model. And again, the role of hubs is very important. Now let's go back to the brain. And let's uh, look at uh, an interesting paper, which is by Daniel Freiman and uh, some of his uh, collaborators. That's the son of Ricardo. It's actually quite nice uh, to be talking about his work. It's quite funny because I know his other son, who is a mathematician. So it's a very small world, I would say. Um, so there is an interesting comparison of the Ising model in two dimensions. So before, what I was doing was uh, for Ising models on random graphs. There's an interesting comparison of the two-dimensional easing model and some data that is obtained from the brain. So you do fMRI data uh, of the brain in its resting state, as it is called. Um, and for this fMRI data, there are about this many uh, sites or voxels. 
Uh, this is actually quite a large number, and this is their dimension. So they are roughly 3 by 3 by 3 mill uh, millimeters. Um, and then what they do is they compare the measured correlations. So remember that when you do these kind of measurements, you get time series, and then what typically is computed is the correlations between the different time series, and that will then give you a matrix of correlations. And of course, you can do precisely the same thing in the Ising model. You think of your Ising model in 2D, and you're measuring it in different locations, spatially quite far away. You look at the time series, because we can interpret the Ising model in a dynamical fashion. You look at the correlation between the time series, and you plot those. And then the question is, do these sequences of correlations look alike? So this is experimentally a very nice way, and you can actually do this for many more different models of the brain. You can just run your dynamics on the brain, do this comparison between fMRI data, and this might tell you something about how applicable the model that you're, that you're simulating is to real fMRI data. Yes? So what Excuse me? What I think Glauber, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so the question is what sort of dynamics they use on the Ising model. And I think it's Glauber dynamics. By the way, uh, a lot of this work is joined with, well, work or presentation is joined with Shandor, Shandor Kolomban, who's sitting right over there. And I hadn't said it yet because he wasn't here on Monday. You missed the flight. That can happen as well. As far as I know, physicists, when they simulate Ising models at the critical temperature, don't use Glauber dynamics because it doesn't evolve fast enough. But and the question is, is it important that it converges fast? I don't know. Yeah, but then... I mean, you can simply look at the correlation structure and see whether it's like what you have in the brain. Is the brain converging to a critical state fast enough? I mean, I'm not making I any claim. Know. I'm just surprised no. that, I mean, when I look the f at the physics literature, people working at the yeah. critical temperature use Switzerland, Switzerland Wong yeah. algorithms. So what happens in this paper is that they uh, simulate the easing model for really long, and they throw away most of the data to get rid of the initial transition going to the uh, stationary phase. So practically in the simulations, they achieve uh, convergence to the stationary distribution by waiting for, I don't know, two hours of simulation, and they only use the rest 10 minutes for the correlation data. So you can assume that the easy model is already at stationarity at the critical point when they do the measurements of the, of the time series and the correlations. And when you look at the time series, actually maybe you do not want it to converge very quickly to stationarity. Because if it would converge very quickly, let's say between two different time units, then you are were, you were going to get independent samples. Then you're taking the risk of having results which depend strongly on where you started from. And it's, uh... Yes. But no, it, so that, that actually takes care of this. Uh, I mean, if you run it very long before you're doing your first measurement, then it should be at stationarity. And after that, you can choose how often you want to measure. But what my, what my claim was, was that maybe the first time you want to run it for two hours, but then maybe between two measurements, you don't want to run two hours. Because then you would get uh, independent uh, realizations. And that's not what you would like. Okay? All right. So this is the picture that they draw. So this is the, uh, this is the picture of the, the, the patients, sort of, uh, of the, the, the distribution of correlations. Uh, these are five different patients, right? Yes, five patients on three or two different. Yeah, so th these are the patients. These are the real measurements, the fMRI. And this is the Ising model. And as you see, it doesn't look very alike. And that's because they've actually simulated the Ising model for different uh, parameter values. And what they're saying is that the red thing is somewhat alike the red thing here. So the red thing is the critical Ising model, whereas the other ones are either sub or supercritical. So the super and super, uh, sub and supercritical Ising models clearly do not match, but the critical, they claim, does seem to be matching because these correlation structures are quite alike. So I think this is very interesting because it actually gives us a way, a methodology, to compare processes um, that we try to use to model the brain to real fMRI data. 
So that, I think, is one of the crucial aspects. That you could apply also to non-easing models. Yes? I'm sorry, what are the axes? Uh, this is the correlations. Time series. It's so for the easing model, that would be, um, I take two vertices, I look at the spins there, how alike are they? So, so the each, correlation between that. So each spin corresponds to a voxel in this case. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's voxel, no, it's not a voxel. FMRI data, then you have electrodes somewhere, and uh, it might be that just a vertex. So, uh, so the point, uh, on the that's easing easy. model, Yes? What? How did you get to a graph? Oh, they use 2D. Okay, the so two-dimensional lattice. But, of course, I mean, there's no justification for that. You might want to choose a better lattice that mix, ma matches better. So we know that the neurons are actually, they, they have 1,000 connections. Well, in the two-dimensional leasing model, you have two connections. So uh, there, there might be sort of, uh, things that you want to do to extend. Yes? You have then two matrices with connectivities between uh, one being voxel data, bold data, fMRI, resting state data, and the other being the easy model. What is the spatial correlation between these two matrices? These two positive de definite matrices? So, the idea is that in one case you have So in one case you have the correlation matrix of, uh, of the voxels, and in the other case you have correlation matrix of the nodes of the easing model. And how you get to a graph is that you do thresholding, and the thresholding is different in the uh, EG data and it, or the fMRI data, and it's different in the e easing data. You match the different thresholding levels in a way that you want to end up with graphs having the same average degree. So you choose a threshold level on your fMRI data, you try to match a corresponding thresholding level in your easing data. This gives you two graphs, and then you can compare these two graphs. And this graph, uh, these, these pictures show you the uh, distribution of, of the correlation coefficients with respect to distance in the, in the graph. And that's how you see that, uh, well, in terms of distance, if you pick one node and you look at how correlated are the nodes from a given distance from this node, then you see that uh, at the critical, critical temperature of the easing model, the correlation decays slowly, just as in the fMRI data. But if you look at sub or supercritical temperatures, then the correlations do uh, decrease much faster. And that shows you that those are definitely not good models. This is a model that it's not shown to be wrong. So that's the only thing that, that so it says. Basically, at a qualitative level, you see similar things happen. Yeah, yeah. The qualitative level. All right. Now, yesterday we've seen a beautiful talk about uh, bootstrap percolation, so I will not redo everything. Um, but the, the, the model is very simple. We choose an initial random set of excited neurons, um, or uh, initial set of active vertices, and then we, we, we pass on the, the, the activation to vertices that have at least a certain number of activated neighbors. The number that we pick is k, Think of k being equal to 2. And uh, uh, then this is a, a, a time dynamics, but it's a monotone dynamics, and you tend to grow your set of active vertices. And what typically happens is sort of in many, uh, many different settings is that there exists this critical number um, of, of vertices, and we typically take them uniformly at random. And when you start with more than that, you actually almost evade everything activate everything. If you start below that, you will activate very little. Right? So you, you can, this is something that Thomas didn't talk about yesterday. You can do it in discrete time rounds. That's actually what uh, Thomas was describing. But you could also do it in continuous time, where you basically assign a clock to every uh, uh, vertex, and when the clock rings, you decide whether you want to activate that site or not. So that's a continuous time version. It's not, it typically doesn't make a big difference, but it turns out that in extensions it does make a difference whether you uh, do this discrete or, uh, or uh, continuous. Because one of the problems that uh, a bootstrap percolation has is that it's completely excitatory. So there's no uh, inhibition present at all. So 
if you would want to put in some sort of an inhibition, and you have to, well, this is actually the explanation, when a signal activates a small part of a local ensemble of neurons, the activity will spread. So uh, neurons are exciting each other. But this is only up to a certain point, because the inhibitory neurons are going to play a, a, a strong role as well. And if the in inhibitory neurons are becoming strong enough to stop the spread of the activation, then actually the, 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 the activation will start to die out. So somehow the inhibition is important to stabilize the system. And this effect is observed experimentally, and Heger in 92, calls this the normalization of cell responses. I think she like this is a, uh, a, ni a quite nice phrase. So there is a model that includes this inhibition. I will talk about that in the, in the next uh, uh, slide. Um, you can do that again, discrete or continuous, but discrete has, is very weird behavior, so I will stick to continuous uh, versions there. So what is a continuous time version? This is a paper by Einarsson, Lengler, Mousset, Panagiotou, and Steger, Angelica, Angelica Steger. And what you do is you have a continuous time process where you uh, decide that there's a certain proportion of inhibitory uh, neurons. So what we've been told is that the, number of the proportion of inhibitory neurons is roughly 15%. Some people say 10, some people say 20. So think of tau, this parameter here, of that order of magnitude. And it's a directed system, it's a directed graph, and just like neurons, the brain actually is connected. It makes a difference whether you send out an axon that connects to a dendrite of somebody else or the other way around. So there is some uh, directionality in, in the brain. And each directed edge with an excitory origin is independently present with a certain probability p. Every directed edge with an inhibitory origin is independently present with a probability gamma times p. So you allow for there to be a difference between edges between inhibitory cells and excitatory cells and the other way around. It's a directed system, and this gives you a little bit more flexibility into the system. Okay? Now, we again take P to be in, this, uh, in between this, uh, this range. That's a range that uh, we've already seen uh, in Thomas's talk yesterday. So this is precisely the same regime that is quite crucial in uh, the system without inhibition. Ah, yes, that's written here. Activation spreads when the number of excitatory active neighbors exceeds the inhibitory neighbors. So that, yeah, there is a balance. So if I have five excitatory neighbors, K is two, but I have four inhibitory neighbors, I'm not going to become activated. So they really stabilize the system. It, it becomes more difficult to become active or excitatory. Is that clear? Okay. No, this is very different from pruning edges. Why? Because it actually depends on how many inhibitory neighbors you have. So actually, the threshold to become activated becomes larger when you have more inhibitory neighbors. That's quite different. Yeah. So what happens here? You have behavior that depends on the parameters in the model. The my parameters here are gamma and... Uh, sorry, where is gamma? Uh, gamma is here and tau is here. And actually, the regime for all of these P's is very similar. That's something that we also saw yesterday in Thomas's talk. And if, gamma, if, if uh, uh, tau is, is quite small, so there are not many inhibitory vertices, then the process is basically the same as if there weren't any inhibition. So the system almost percolates. You almost activate everything. But if tau is strictly larger than this value, then actually there is this critical value, which is, has a, a specific form. The precise form is not important, but there is a, a precise formula for it. If you excite more than this number of, uh, or if you activate more than this number of individuals at the onset of your system, then actually you will spread to many. And many in this case means that it's linear with n, with some proportionality constant that again depends on the parameters tau and gamma. So here you really see that you have to activate... Um, so if you have a lot of inhibition of this nature, you have to activate more than uh, if you don't have any inhibition. And this might actually be a reasonable effect. Just yes. a comment. Should be exceeds the inhibitory active neighbors as well, no? Because the inhibitory cells should be active as well. 
No? Yeah. Because it's not only the presence of inhibitory uh, neighbor. They should be active as well, no? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, there's another extension of uh, um, bootstrap percolation, which is called neuropercolation. Here are a few papers. Uh, Cosma and Pulic have, uh, have uh, investigated that uh, in, in great detail. And Ballester and Bolabash are the same mathematicians that Thomas was talking about uh, uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, it is a generalization of bootstrap percolation, but it also allows for more randomness. So the, in bootstrap percolation itself, the, the activation strategy is completely deterministic. And in neural percolation, it's not. Um, so it, it, it models the, dan the dynamical behavior of what is sometimes called a neural pill, which is the densely interconnected neural tissue in the cortex. But probably many of you know that much better than I do. All right, so how does it go? So the activation of a vertex at time t um, in vertex x is denoted by at of x, so that's a number uh, which is either 0 or 1. 0 inactive, 1 active. And, and then, the for example, yeah, I think that's how you should think about it. So then you look at the event that says that, well, the, the, the total number of my active neighbors, so this is your neighborhood set, is at most uh, the total number of neighbors divided by 2. So it's something like a majority rule. Is more than half my neighbors active or is more than half my neighbors inactive? And then an inactive X will be turned into active with probability epsilon 1 when CT occurs, when this event occurs, and with probability 1 minus epsilon 1 when, it, when its complement occurs. So this is a random rule because here you do things with a certain probability rather than with probability 0 or 1 as in the previous case. And for an active x, you turn it inactive with probability epsilon 2 when ct occurs, and with probability 1 minus epsilon 2 when ct complement occurs. And you can think of this as being excitation, and this is inhibition. And from a, a numerical point of view, a simulation point of view, what they argue is that the critical behavior of this system is very rich, and it somehow interpolates between the easing model and regular bootstrap percolation, depending on how you choose the parameters. Actually, regular bootstrap percolation is a particular example where epsilon 1 is equal to 1 and epsilon 2 is equal to 0. So it's really an extension of uh, a bootstrap percolation. Now, a, a final model that I would like to discuss are integrated fire models, or sometimes also called abelian sand piles. And this is related to the fact that these models show self-organized criticality, which is quite interesting. And uh, Cosma and Pulis also uh, say something about that. And they say criticality is arguably the key aspect for brains in their rapid adaptation, reconfiguration, and high storage capacity, and sensitive response to external stimuli. That's, of course, something that we have to do in our brain. If we have external stimuli, we should decide whether we're going to react to that or not. And we would actually damp like to dampen out a lot of this information because the fact that there is a fruit fly flying there that I might observe is not going to affect my, my, my behavior. Whereas if there is a bear running towards me at a close distance, it will probably. Right? So you, you want to respond to certain events, but not to all events. If you're going to respond to everything that you're observing, you're going to com become completely crazy. So... What, he's, what they are saying is that during recent years, self-organized criticality and neural avalanches became important concepts to describe neural systems. And uh, avalanches, uh, a particular example of that, are integrated in fire models. So what do you do? Again, we have some sort of a graph of which we think of as being the, uh, the, the, the system of neurons and their connectivities. And now for every vertex x, we associate a height to it. This height is always in between 0 and the degree of the vertex minus 1. And um, this is when it's stable, and now we start throwing sort of stimuli in it, thinking of it as being grains of sand, and that might actually make certain vertices unstable, and then when it becomes unstable, you actually give one of your grains to all of your neighbors, you might make some of them unstable, and then they again do the same thing, etc., etc. And actually it's called the abelian sand pile because the order in which you pass on grains from one vertex to the other, does not matter. It doesn't matter whether I first give my grains to my neighbors, then the first neighbor does it, 
or the second neighbor, or the precise origin, the precise order in which you do it is completely irrelevant. That's why it's called a Belian sand pile. So if a vertex remains stable, you do nothing. If a vertex turns unstable, then you topple. You give a grain to each of your neighbors. When a grain is given to a sink, there's a certain amount of sinks in the system, which describes inhibition, then the grain just simply disappears. Um, and uh, when more vertices become unstable, you keep on toppling. You topple as long as the moment up to which everything is stable again, and then you're done. This might take a very long time, but because you have a, a, a certain amount of sinks, this will eventually happen. Because the sinks will actually attract grains, and therefore they, these will disappear from the system. So that makes it dissip dissipative. Is it synchronized? Everything is synchronized? Or? It doesn't matter because of the Belian nature. So, but that's a, but that's a, that's a lemma. Yes, or is it obvious? that's a theorem. Or <laughs> it's not easy, but it's it's true. Yes, it basically means that the sort of the, the order in which you do operations such as add, uh, addition doesn't really matter. But it's a bit more complicated than that. There is a reality on this sink concept. Well, you could th think of the sinks as being the inhibitory neurons. Because they, they, they do get something, but then they, they don't do much. It's a very s simplified model, and maybe you should... You should adapt the model uh, more carefully to, to model the brain. But I think of the sinks as, as modeling inhibition. So in the sand pile, I would think about inhibition is that if I'm a sink, then the pile next to me, he cannot really excite the others because he's giving you his sand to me and I'm swallowing it. So if, if a, a pile has an inhibitory neighbor, it means that he cannot have much effect on his other neighbors because the sand is sucked away by the sinks. So that's another way of thinking about inhibition and sinks in this model. But I have a little bit um, yep. a problem in understanding yep. how it can, um, I would say, contribute for, for yeah. understanding the brain. Is that it's everything topological, correct? So the position where the, these inhibitory um, elements yeah. in relation to the excitatory is uh, very important. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's very important. So there might, be a certain, there might be a certain rule as to how you choose your sinks. I haven't said anything about that. And that might, might have to be a rule that you need to tune in to modeling the brain. So, for example, in this bootstrap percolation example, they just picked the inhibitory neurons uniformly at random with a certain probability. I'm not sure whether that's the right way of doing it. Maybe you want to bring in more of the topology of how real neurons interact, I mean, the excitatory and the in inhibitory neurons. Now, in terms of the dynamics of the network, it would be very interesting to try to understand if these topology where you have yep. the excitatory and the inhibitory elements can generate oscillations. And I have seen in, uh, one, in one of your um, modules, if you go back to your presentation, which one? I will show uh, the, okay. the one. If you Today? Yes, no, 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 no. One more. One more. You have uh, some. No, not back. Forwards. Forward, Four. forward, forward. One more. Here you have um, this um, um, paper there. Neuro, neuropercolation for modeling brain oscillations in um, criticality. It would be. Uh, could you explain a little bit? How these... I'm sorry, I cannot. I don't know precisely. Do you know, Ashandor? So, about oscillations, the idea was that by adding this random noise that can allow activated neurons to be activated, that you can actually So um, a very simple model, like an easy model, can yep. um, produce an, and explain... Uh, well, in model. this case, neural percolation, apparently. I'm not sure whether the easy model could. Well, you might be able to do that by having a time-varying external field, for example, but oscillations, whether the model can produce oscillations. Yeah, you can have the following thing. If you have the easy model, a low temperature and a finite volume, yep. and then you, you have this, you, you stay long time, 
in uh, the plus phase and then ah, yeah. Right. And then after, uh, in a yeah. predict amount of time, you change. And this is an old, old result by yeah. Schoem and Neb, um, yeah. right. maybe Fernandes. Yeah, so I mean, the, the basically the statement is that if the temperature is very low, all the spins want to be aligned. If there's no external field, you don't have any preference. So if you switch on the dynamics, what will happen is that uh, on a finite domain, most of them will be aligned. But every once in a while, the alignment changes. Because, of course, I mean, in the long-term stationary probability, you will be equally likely, the proportion of times where you see basically the plus state will be equal to the proportion of time where you will see the minus state. So that means that you will have to go from one to the other and back. So you can think of this as being an oscillation. And this will take a very long time, and then you will stay in the other uh, uh, type for a very long time, and then you will go back for a very long time, etc. So that's some kind of an oscillation. But it's not a critical leasing. Henko, yeah. uh, your sinks. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's better to interpret not as inhibitor neurons, because inhibitor neurons inhibit something. Mm -hmm. But as excitatory or normal neurons with a, a high threshold to be excited. So they save, uh -huh. but yeah. don't, don't transmit. Right. Don't transmit. So yeah. it, uh, they, it's the equivalent, I think. Yeah, it's very similar, I think. Yeah. It perhaps is yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of mechanism, let, uh, let me uh, complicate a little bit because ah, we, okay. are, we are here for I thought it was already complicated but enough, but... <laughs> okay, so... I don't know, but no, in terms no, was just in, a joke. In, in, it's very important in terms of uh, transmission of uh, information in a generation of a spike that the... Um, but you do the, have oscillations or that the um, very precise um, relationship of the spikes in relation also to the membrane potential fluctuation is important. Yeah. So this idea that you can have channels of uh, communication being created by, uh, by oscillation, this is a very relatively new and, and very powerful concept of okay. how information flows uh, in, in through the, the system. system. Through the system. Okay. I would love to see some references for that. All right. Uh, where were we? Yes. So inhibition may be present in this Sibelian sandpile model because of the presence of sinks. And maybe this is not the right way of viewing sinks. There may be other ways. Uh, I'm not sure whether that would make a very big difference. Uh, but some of these sinks could also reflect the response of motor units. Motor, sorry, the, the, the response of the motor network. So you have some sort of a, a signal that comes in. I think of that as being the grains falling down. And then there's information spreading through the system. That's these avalanches. And when it reaches something else, an output neuron or something like that, you might, might get a reaction. Right? So that means that uh, this has a very high dampening effect. Because if you throw some things in, these are the stimuli that we do observe, but that, that we don't react to. That's the majority of the times then actually nothing happens. But it's these occasional um, times where you, somehow, you observe something and you get a large avalanche and you actually respond to it. Um, these are the ones that are important. So I think in the, in the brain we need some sort of a dampening effect where the majority of stimuli actually is completely ignored. It's not going to have a macroscopic effect. But some stimuli actually do create you to, do make you to respond. So this dampening is, is here. Now, why this is a, a, an interesting model is that the model describes self-organized critical, uh, self criticality. And that means that the probability of having avalanches that are quite big is actually substantial. It decays. But you can have macroscopic uh, avalanches. All right. Now, of course, there's much more going on in the brain. And this is, again, extremely uh, um, speculative. Um, one of the things that we typically tend to ignore when thinking about the brain is the fact that the brain probably changes because of the things that we do. Now, one way of viewing this is, is sometimes called Hebbian learning, and it basically says that um, uh, a connection that has been used is more likely to be used later on. As connections that you're not using um, are less likely to be used later on. So that's sometimes called pruning, 
So it basically says, if you fire together, if you some, some, so have some sort of a correlation of doing things together, then you also wire together. Um, and if you're not using something, then you're actually going to be losing the connections. So use it or lose it. And um, one way of incorporating that is by adding edge weights to the graph, where the edge weights are dynamic and actually depend on the process that lives on your graph. So an edge weight will increase, let's say, when you do a firing uh, across that edge. And uh, because of all the, f the, the firings ac across edges, all the edge weights will go up. And that means that the ones that haven't been used have a relatively smaller weight, and therefore they might not be used anymore in the future. So one way of doing that is by having these weights, and then rather than saying that, like in the abelian sand pile, I give a piece of grain or I, or I excite my neighbors, I excite all my neighbors, you might want to excite the ones with a higher weight more frequently than the ones with a lower weight. So then you see that while you're building up these weights, you're actually also affecting the process that acts on the brain, and vice versa. So it really goes hand in hand. Now these problems have been investigated in the mathematical literature, much more simple models, and they're called uh, processes with reinforcements. And a, a very basic example is what is called the, the self-reinforced random walk. And a, uh, uh, So first of all, a random walk is, is the a mathematical or stochastic model for how we walk through space. And in this reinforced random walk, the idea is that we're trying to, we're, we're, we're tourists in a foreign city and we're trying to explore our neighborhoods. And if there is a street that we've already traversed many times, we like it, and we're more likely to take that street the next time as well. So that's what is called a reinforced random walk. And, and actually depending... What? We know how to get back to the hotel. Ah, yeah, okay. That's a, that's a good question. And actually, we, we know that in some of these settings, the, the random walk will actually eventually start hopping uh, just crossing one street. So. It depends on the setting. In other settings, you will actually explore more and more. But it typically, the effect of reinforcement is rather dramatic in the sense that the behavior of the random walk is rather different, this, this reinforced random walk, than without the reinforcement. So random walks without reinforcement have been studied for a very long time. We know that they're very close to Brownian motions, etc. These models are really completely different. But that's a much more simple model because you only have one particle that moves around in space. Now, in the brain, you don't have one particle. You don't have one excitation. You have lots of excitations simultaneously. So this model really is much more complicated. Um, all right. Let's go to my conclusions. How much time do I have? Minus five minutes or? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, that's very good. Um, so what I've been trying to explain uh, in my three lectures is that networks are a very useful abstract way of viewing um, elements and the connections between them. So that's basically why graphs are useful in order to study uh, social networks or uh, uh, relations or uh, and maybe the brain. So from an abstract point of view, um, I've described that by this what was called the friendship paradox, which is sort of a mathematical way of looking at graphs and explaining the, uh, the, the paradox that your friends always tend to have more friends than you do. Uh, another, way, uh, another reason why networks are useful is this notion of centrality. By looking at things in an abstract way, you can actually quantify what are the important vertices in your network, depending on what kind of centrality you're interested in. Closeness centrality, between the centrality, etc. Now then, uh, the remarkable find of the past 15 or so years is that many networks actually are very similar in the sense that they ha tend to have a high amount of variability in the number of connections between elements, that is sometimes called scale-free behavior, and many of them tend to be small worlds. Okay. Um, in order to model these networks, we use random graph models, and we use these to explain properties of real-world networks, uh, as well as, um, as benchmark models to compare real-world networks to. And the brain is an example, of course, the human brain, we don't really have a map of. So there it's a bit more complicated. You have to rely on other things. So graph theory in general is a useful tool for neuroscience. Um, for example, these, uh, um, these graphs that are obtained by looking at EEG data and then thresholding, uh, that will give you just a binary graph. And the fact that 
uh, these graphs are claimed to be different in Alzheimer patients compared to sort of control groups, that's quite interesting. So it might give away, when we understand this better, of actually detecting certain diseases early on. So the question is, is that indeed possible, or am I just completely dreaming out here? Um, so graph theory could be a useful, uh, useful tool for neuroscience, and one of the, 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 the big hypotheses that I've been making throughout my lectures is that on the one hand we can think of the brain as having a certain topology that describes the interconnections between neurons or maybe at a higher hierarchical level between functional units in the brain and on the other hand we have the functionality of the brain which I can think of as being a process acting on it. So that's my, my main hypothesis in the lectures that I've been uh, talking about today. Now if you're interested in random graph theory this is a book in, uh, uh, in preparation. It's almost done. It has been there already for about 10 years or so. So I really should finish it. Uh, these are lecture notes at a very basic mathematical level. It is mathematical. So it's really aimed at fourth-year math students. That's why I wrote these notes, because I was teaching a random graphs course in Eindhoven at that level, and I was realizing that all the books that were available were just not understandable for my students. So I started writing something myself, and I really try to explain why we're interested in network models. So I also treat many real-world network examples, and then uh, I, um, I prove some mathematical properties of these models. So it is aimed at the mathematical audience, let's say fourth-year uh, uh, students, master students, but I think it might also be a good source for people who just want to learn a little bit about random graph theory. Just forget about all of the theorems or just forget about all of the proofs and just glance through it as a, at a leisurely space, uh, uh, pace and just try to understand sort of what the models look like and why they are invented in the way that they are invented. Because that's also what I try to explain in these notes. Are you going to include this, this last material we told us today in our notes? Ah, that's too detailed. I, I do have a, a little description of uh, sort of ran, uh, random graphs for the brain or, or, or real-world brain networks, and I am thinking about expanding that, but I will not treat stochastic processes on, uh, on graphs because that's not the aim of this, of this uh, book. That deserves a completely different book because there's lots of things that have been investigated on random graphs, sort of random walks, uh, statistical physics models, models for disease spread, models for rumor spread, tons of different models and they, they all depend very sensitively on the precise topology but there's just so much work you would not be able to treat that in a fourth year math students book that's too much yeah. alright thank you very much First, a remark. If you have no inhibition, yeah. then AC, you would just take tau to be a zero yeah. here. Uh, that the result, if you have just bootstrap percolation on GNP. Yeah. So if you have inhibition, you get something which is proportional to uh, what happens without inhibition. So it seems that this is the same order of magnitude. And therefore, the in inhibition, the same order of magnitude for the threshold. So the inhibition doesn't stop the first stages in a way of uh, the spread of activation. Right. You see in the brain, maybe it's like that. The inhibition is not so efficient at the beginning. But then at the end, the size of the set of active vertices is not N at all. It's... Uh, then we as yeah, this 1 minus 2 to the power k. So you've got also this feature that you activate only a part of the, um, of the network. Yeah. So actually, it's kind of a remark about it. And, um, and the question is more to the biologist, maybe to you. Does it make sense to you, this behavior, that inhibition is fine at the beginning, but has a, an impact at the end?
on the final set of activities. Mm -hmm. Claudia. Sorry, Thomas. Do you, 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 your question is whether inhibition might be lower in the beginning of the process? Hmm. Not really. It's just it's always the same process from the beginning to the end. But the impact is not very huge at the beginning, but important at the end. When you have to define what is the beginning and yeah. the end. Okay. I mean. What is the beginning? Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the, the difficulties about uh, bootstrap percolation. I, I think the, the, the way to view bootstrap percolation is what happens in the brain, let's say, when a certain stimulus arrives and how it spreads through the system. But there, bootstrap percolation stops, whereas, of course, your brain continues. Yeah, so you, there should be a way to somehow say, ah, I've now seen this spread, now it disappears again, and I start afresh. Or I start. So there's no real time evolution beyond let's say, the effect of the stimuli and their effect on, on the brain. It really stops there. And that's, of course, not how the brain works. For sure, it's very important somehow trying to um, bring these um, concepts and models for our understanding of the brain. The problem is that the brain is um, too complex. So let's um, take parts of the brain, for instance, um, uh, a network that is uh, in a way that you can grasp uh, easily, easier. Mm -hmm. um, possibility, the retina. And I was very fascinated with many uh, interesting things and very important for understanding perception, like when you say um, how, how things are eventually could explain, for instance, saliency, eventually could explain things like attention, and you're always coming with your, um, um, how you say, um, uh, fruit fly, why you ignore a fruit fly or not. This is a very extremely important concept in vision that you're understanding very poorly. So my proposal is to take a very simple model, uh, the retina. We have it in an anesthetized cat and um, try to apply some of these concepts related to the spread of activity even to oscillations that are um, in many um, of uh, sensory motor um, systems and, and, and to, to try perhaps uh, to have um, a common ground. Yes, just to, to reinforce what Sergio said and very quickly because we have to leave soon. Uh, I agree with him that we should maybe focus on specific processes that are going on in the brain, select them and try to model them because then, then we can maybe address the point that you, you have put forward and uh, which I think is really important is that the fact that the process also modifies the network and then, I mean, how to tackle this? It's maybe by selecting some specific process. So, for instance, um, the percolation model, it's could be very uh, interesting to, to discuss in terms of plasticity, I mean, the mechanisms of plasticity that we find in the sensory motor cortex. For instance, when, when you reduce the income and outcome activity in these surfaces, then the inhibition goes down. The inhibitory circuits just reduce their expression level. So, for instance, just to start so discussing. It is time dependent. Yes. So thank you. Um, I think we should leave no, let me say uh, let me say a few words. Uh, I would like to thank very much the three lecturers, but maybe in particular uh, Henk and Sandro because they made a huge effort to, to collect new material in a few weeks. Uh, we discussed we started, started discussing it uh, July uh, August, and then I asked, could you please Henk tell us about uh, neural neural models? In, and it was tough, and they did it quite well. 
And uh, I guess one, something I was feeling in this project uh, that uh, our global reflection on random graphs was not uh, yet uh, at the level it would, was required. And I guess this lectures by Sander and, and Renko put us in an other level. I think that's the beginning of a very fruitful collaboration. Thank you very much, Sander. And, uh, People, we are getting back to home, getting back home, no matter, for the last lecture. Because here there are problems, it was already uh, took by another activity, so let's get back home. <laughs>